morning, everyone. First start, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Bansi Sabu and organizer for inviting me. And uh, I welcome you all. And thank you, everyone, who is attending this session, sparing their valuable time from their busy practice and listening to me. Today's talk is DAPA care. As a disclaimer, it's an AstraZeneca talk. What I would be talking is my own thoughts in this slides. So we know that the guidelines have evolved totally. Now you don't find an indication to start an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist. Now is the era where you find contraindication that, okay, this patient should not be started. Otherwise, there is an indication to start an SGLT2 inhibitor. So we have come long way with the starting AMPAREG and declared TIMI trial. And then we had this in the heart failure, emperor reduce, emperor preserve, your DAPA HF, deliver, DAPA CKD, EMPA kidney, all those trials. So let us talk some basics about what's the new thing and what else have evolved and where you should prescribe this drug. So if you see almost close to 300 publications have been there and two third of them are from very good journal, very high impact journal like NEGM, JAMA, Lancet, Nature. And these are the very important trials. Some of them I'll discuss. It's not practically possible to discuss everything within 15 minutes. So phase three trial was there. And after this, the, it was launched, the dapaglyphosin, the original innovator brand was for SIGA. And then we had this declared TME, which had that uh, this three point maze was not significant. And that brought some bad name to the DAPA. But then we had this DAPA CKD, DAPA HF, Deliver, Delight, CVD, Real, Your Determined Preserve, DAPA Ag, DAPA MI, and DAPA MAC. So now is what they are doing is they are collaborating, they are including all this data. So close to 34,000 patients are included in these trials. And we have CV studies, which I've just told. And then we have renal studies as well, the DEPA CKD and the Delight. And then we have some mechanical studies, also some functional studies about the cardiac markers. All those things are there. So let's talk about what is new in the renal trial. So this is very important slide you can see here. The earlier, the, the earlier you start this, more years you will gain, more years you will prevent the patient from going into ESRD. So these are some trials, your DAPA CKD deliver, DAPA HF, DAPA CK, uh, uh, CKD, and your declared trial. The higher, edge, uh, higher EGFR you have, the earlier you initiate, the better it would be, more years you would be saving the patient. And this is again very good study, around 6,000 patients were included. And those patients who were prescribed dapaglyphosin from 2015 to 2020, they were studied. And there was comparator, mainly that is from the DPP-4 inhibitor, GLP-1 receptor agonist, but they have included all the sulfonyl, urea, pioglitazone, acarbose, everything was there. And there was a propensity match, it's an observational study. And you can see that over time, the rate of decline of EGFR was much lesser in those patients who were started dapaglyphosin. Also the change of USCR over time was significantly different in those patients who were started dapaglyphosin. And this again is a very good trial, though a very small number, some where seven patients were included. We don't have data that whether you can prescribe this in hemodialysis patient or not. CKD stage five who are already on renal replacement therapy. So they studied that 10 mg was given before dialysis and every hour, every half an hour for four hours the sample was taken and then on 48 hours again the drug was given and then consecutively six days was given. And what you find that there was no stacking of the drug. It was not like that, that the higher level were achieved for the dapaglyphosin and no adverse effect were noted in these type of patients also. So this is very good, but the only thing is number is very small in this data. Okay, now this is from the DAPA CKD trial where almost 4,000 patients were included for 2.5 years. Both diabetic, non-diabetic patients were studied for the renal benefit. This is a subgroup analysis which showed that those patients who had anemia, those who were on DAPA glyphosin, they had improvement. And those without anemia developed less anemia during those 2.5 years. So there are some different mechanisms by which DAPA glyphosin increases. One of them is it's a diuretic and then also it promotes your uh, hematopoiesis, okay? Now let's talk about what is newer trial in your cardiovascular region for the DAPA. Now this is a pooled data of your DAPA HF and deliver. One is for your reduced ejection fraction. The other one is for your preserved ejection fraction. So here you can see when you pool the data, 
what you can see that there was significant difference in the CV death, total heart failure hospitalization, first heart failure hospitalization, and CV death or heart, uh, heart failure hospitalization. Three point miss, which was non significantly different in your first trial, which was declared to me, here you can see it reached significance. Also, all cause death was significantly different. Now, this is again a very good study. Here again, the data is pooled. See, when you give a uh, SGLT2 inhibitor, there is slight drop in your EGFR. Everybody of us know that. So whether, like the trial for dapagliflozin was about 25 only. So whether you can prescribe them after the HP, this EGFR has dropped or not. So that is what is studied in this study. So this is the pooled again data for the DAPA HF and the deliver almost 11,000 patients. And you see that almost 74% patients continued their drug against placebo even after having an EGFR of less than 25, which was their initiation, right? That's the DAPA CKD in which they took EGFR more than 25 to 75 with protein urea of 200 to 5,000 as the criteria for inclusion. And here you can see that overall there was no significant difference in the discontinuation and no deterioration in EGFR versus who had this less than uh, 25. Both had, irrespective of this, worsening of heart failure was prevented in both, CV death was prevented in both, and no adverse effect was there. That means if, say, patient drops his EGFR after initiation of your therapy. It's not what I'm saying that you start below 25. You understand the difference, okay? Now, this again is a good study which showed that whether uh, hospitalization was in, uh, increasing or not, so that we know, and deliver and DAPA HF both, whether you talk about complicated heart failure, that is those requiring intensive care, whether you talk about uncomplicated, both were prevented in the patient group who received DAPA glyphosin. Again, this is a very good study. What we had is CVOT trial. Now what they are talking about is cardiac remodeling. So DAPA MODA study, around 250 patients were included. And what they did, a baseline investigation, one month investigation, and six month investigation. And what they analyzed is mainly they attributed the uh, left atrium volumetric index is what they evaluated along with end diastolic volume, end systolic volume, anti-pro BNP, and your LV mass. Okay, so these things were improved, and this is the graph. We don't have time much, but everything was Im improved. Mainly, it was for the changes of LA volume index. That was their major uh, criteria to see. That was their main thing. Now, let's talk about another study, DAPA-MI. This is a new study. So what they did here, that those patients who had recent MI, less than 10, and who were not initially diabetic, who don't have heart failure, whose EGFR is okay, more than 20, they were included, provided they had some LV uh, systolic dysfunction and Q-wave MI, a recent onset, not a previous one, okay? And they were hemodynamically stable. So almost 4,000 patients were included and three months follow-up was there. Again, DEPA 10 mg was given against the standard therapy for your maintain, uh, this LV dysfunction and MI. And what they, uh, their uh, out, uh, outcome was, primary outcome was to see the win ratio. Now, win ratio is something which we do in trading actually. Okay, win ratio is, that means how many win, how many gains you have against the losses. That is what is win ratio is there. So for this, the significance win ratio was taken as 1.2. Okay, now here the primary outcome was death, hospitalization to heart failure, MI event, arterial fibrillation, type 2 diabetes, NYHA uh, grading, and weight decrease. So all those were significantly different, and when you come remove this weight decrease, again, it was significantly different in those groups. Now, mind you, these are non-diabetic patients of recent onset MI. Like, initially, what we used to think, ki bhai dapagliflozin, ampagliflozin, acute setting mein nahi dena hai. Now, what we are finding that in acute setting also, you have advantages. Okay, now let's talk about what is other than this. So this is regarding the NFLD. Here, nine trials are included in this meta-analysis. And you see that overall, the liver enzyme, whether you talk about ALT, AST, or GGT, that was improved in the lipid metabolism. Triglyceride were decreased, whereas the total cholesterol, LDL, and HDL were non-significantly changed in these studies. Now, this is regarding the renal anemia. I've already told how it improves. We can just skip for the time. 
And this is another study, the delivered trial, what they did is they divided this you know, according to the paralytic cars. Okay, so there is something called Rockwool classification where one to nine points are given and accordingly they have divided it. Now what they want is that those who are frail, they are also improving or not, that is they what they want to see in this study. So here what they saw that whether you talk about the frail patient, most frail patient, non-frail patient, the dapagliflozin was acting similarly in the heart failure. Okay, because those who are at severe end may not be that benefited with the drug. Those who are lesser may not show that reference. So that is what they want to see here. So if this is again the DAPA CKD, there what they did is 25 to 75 that was taken as criteria with an protein urea of 200 to 5000 milligram. Now they did a subgroup analysis. In subgroup analysis what they did is they took only those patients who had an EGFR less than 30 because it's an more of an end stage disease, right? They are at more severe end. So they want to know whether the drug is acting even then or not when we are introducing late in the course of diabetes. So that is what they want to see. So here what they saw that overall group of the DAPA CKD versus this subgroup analysis performed equally well. That means even if you are initiating late, then also the patient would get benefited with your DAPA glyphosate. Now this is again a PCOS study where four trials were included. This is published from India only. Okay, here what they found that the uh, body weight and the fasting glucose and the HOMA IR and the DHA level were significantly different in those patients who received dapagliflozin. It was not actually for dapagliflozin, it was for an SGLT2 inhibitor overall that it was significant. But what they found is that total testo and FAI, that is your free androgen index, was non-significantly different in this study. It's a small uh, four study and the uh, heterogeneous data was there. But yes, you have some data that yes, it may be helping in your PCOS group as well. Now this is again a DAOS study, a new study. We know that those patients who have heart failure has more of sleep apnea. So we want to know whether this drug is acting on that or not. So they did is a three uh, month study with almost 100 patient and it's a randomized control trial where they saw that your apnea, hypoapnea index, hypoapnea index, all those were significantly improved in those patients who received your dapagliflozin. Also, your cardiac parameters were improved, including your inflammatory markers like your CRP and interleukin-6 were reduced in those patients who were on the DAPA group. Can SGLT inhibitors prevent incidental gout? So we know these drugs are uricouric. So this is an again meta-analysis of five studies. And here what they found that in the subgroup analysis, it was dapagliflozin and canagliflozin which was working more rather than your empagliflozin. And when they removed the study of empagliflozin, in this five study, there was one study of empagliflozin. When they removed it, it was even more significant. So yes, it can reduce something around 30% gout, it can reduce your SGLT2 inhibitor. I'm talking as a group here. Now this is my last and final slide. Here it's a very busy slide, but if you want, you can just take a picture. This will give you a crux of everything, okay? So here you can see in heart failure, we know that it is acting, no doubt over that, it's a group effect. So it's there. In diabetes, whether you are talking about with heart failure, it is reducing your cardiac mortality without heart failure and without CKD, it's not very clear. There is some difference, but it's not statistically significant. And in chronic kidney disease, again, it is helping overall if you combine as a group without heart failure, we don't know much, but with heart failure, it is acting much more. Okay, and with the heart failure, without diabetes, without CKD, also it is acting with CKD and with diabetes, also it is acting. So this is a crux of your SGLT2 inhibitors. Okay, so almost it's a meta-analysis of uh, 15 studies. All the data is there and they have included everything here. In 15 um, studies, they have included for this meta-analysis. Thank you.